Good morning, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is that you are listening, folks. Thank you very, very much for listening. Today is the 30th of August, year of our Lord, 2020, 24. Welcome to yet another edition of The Coping Hour, hosted by Nicholas Enkel, a.k.a. Motown Noah. Got a big show for you guys today. Might be a little bit on the faster-paced side. We may be going like, bah, 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 a lot today because we're doing something new. We're trying something unprecedented. Because my schedule is just kind of all over the place and I'm otherwise not going to be able to record the show when I would normally record the show, I'm having to instead do it incrementally while my son is napping. So if we're kind of jumping around and doing a bunch of stuff in this episode, I apologize just because I have to keep a, uh, I guess I should maybe leave one of these off. I got to keep a watchful ear out to make sure that my son uh, doesn't, uh, well, that nothing happens on my watch. Is bad. <laughs> but I got to record the show, right? We got to do this. So um, let's do a, a little bit of housekeeping up top. I want to, I want to clarify some stuff, give you guys some peace of mind, because in the in the previous episode we did a segment about the the most consequential individual NBA champions of the last twenty five years. Narratively, I got it's it's always so clunky when I say it that way. Got to think of a, a, a sexier way to say all of that. But okay, so we did the top five and we we ran down the list and and there was a glaring omission of Kawhi Leonard. And his ring with the Toronto Raptors and, and how we will, you know, look with a magnifying glass on that maybe in 10 years and be like, whoa, Kawhi Leonard really did that shit in the Uncle Dennis year. A hundred percent. And I think that the Raptors ring was kind of like a 1B to the Bucks 1A in terms of favorite championships that I've been alive for. Because it was just kind of one of those teams that you didn't really expect to be in the mix uh, just through virtue of them being, like, not one of the major markets or anything like that. I'm not talking about, like, who was actually on the roster, but it's like, whoa, Toronto won a championship the same way. Yeah, Milwaukee may have had the best team the year that they – is that true? Let's not talk about that. That doesn't matter. They had a really, really good team, but it's still Milwaukee. You know what I mean? So it's still fun. For sure, I think Kawhi does maybe belong on the list. I think for me he was, like, sixth. And the only reason I didn't put him on there was just because I'm like, how much is that going to matter to people who didn't watch? And that's kind of how I was looking at it. It was through that lens. Because for us, for those of us who lived through the Kawhi Leonard, San Antonio Spurs saga, and then again, everything that came with Uncle Dennis and his departure from San Antonio, uh, trying to force his way elsewhere, but ended up, Greg Popovich was like, what the fuck? No, you're going to go wherever I want you to go and wherever we can get the best thing in return. And the best thing that we can get in return is DeMar DeRozan. So guess what, buddy? Get ready to learn French. You're going to Canada. And then in one year, Kawhi Leonard wins a championship. And then I think the the media buzz that came after it was also kind of the fun part of it. And it's easy to forget how crazy that was. Like, how, like man, Kawhi goes to this new team for one year, actually wins a championship, not like on his own, but still as the guy on the team um, in, a, in a crowded Eastern Conference. And so it was, yeah, man, it's not nothing. It's not nothing. It's just the way that the rest of his career has gone. And in totality, the whole thing is just so weird. And it's more about me being skeptical of us really talking about him all that much, like 10 years from now. I don't know. I don't know. I just, not that he's like going to get, not that he's going to be one of those dudes who's sort of lost in the pages of history because he's not just a one-time NBA champion. He's a two-time NBA champion. Right, he's a finals two-time finals. Imp- I don't remember, but he's also won a defensive player of the year. So, does he deserve a spot on the list? Yeah, but I just think it's sixth. I just think it is. And then another one that was thrown out there was Dwayne Wade in two thousand and six. Maybe, maybe narratively, I don't know. I don't. I honestly don't know. So that's part of the reason I didn't put it in there. Do you wonder if maybe if Dwayne Wade doesn't win in two thousand and six? Does that fuck up the big three? Does that fuck up the Heatles? Does LeBron decide that he wants to go somewhere else because who are they playing that year, Dallas? Does he does he instead say, I actually want to go play with Dirk because I watched him get it done at this really high level? It's kind of like I'm trying to put it in like modern terms. Like what's the closest thing that we could get to that being a reality? This is going to be like the weirdest straw man argument that you've ever heard in your fucking life. But I don't know. Let's talk about it. Still the offseason. So if Anthony Edwards two years from now wins a championship it's 2026 and then five years removed from that for some reason Victor Wembanyama still hasn't won an NBA championship and he's like looking at the landscape and he's like who's a dude who's proven and who's gotten it done in the past and who I who I know I can get over the hump with probably Anthony Edwards and in some way they kind of decide to team up like would Anthony Edwards losing a see this is kind of where I'm losing myself would Anthony Edwards losing a final impede 
Victor Wimbanyama's um, ability, not ability, but his desire to to team up with him. What the? F- I I don't know. I get. I guess maybe. So uh, okay. So that's that. And because we got kind of a jam packed show today, folks, why don't I not waste any more of your time and and we just jump right into today's program. And we're going to start off with an email, copinghoursubs at gmail.com, spelled phonetically. Email will be available in the description wherever it is that you listen to this program. Uh, This one comes into us from Drew. Drew, welcome back to the show. Subject line, first time all-stars. Hey, Nick, I've emailed into the show a few times. Um, And each time that I do, I make sure to mention that Benedict Matherin will be the 2025 most improved player. Now, this might be because I'm a delusional Pacers fan who believes that if he was healthy, we would have won the finals last year. Or maybe it's because he got a haircut and a half sleeve of tattoos this offseason. Just to break the email, he didn't have that much hair to begin with. Right? So, I mean, I don't know. I guess if... If you're if it's braided, that actually means you have a lot of hair, and just because you have really tight braids doesn't, you know what I mean? So I, so what did he do? Just buzz it? I didn't even know about the tattoos either. But anyways, let's get back to the email. Either way, I do believe in the next year or two he will make the jump and achieve his first All Star appearance. That led me to think about other players who might be on the brink of their first All Star selection. The obvious low hanging fruit would be Victor Wembanyama. Other players that came to mind are Jonathan Kaminga and Cade Cunningham. With Clay gone, I feel like Kaminga might be in prime position to take that next step and become an all star caliber player. All star caliber player. Same with Cade. Although the guards in the East are stacked with the talent, he might be able to good stats, bad team his way into an all star spot. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on who you think will most likely make the jump that next uh, that that jump next year. Best regards, Drew. Drew, thank you very much for this. You guys want to start with Jonathan Kaminga? I don't think he's first on this list, but I want to I want to give a quick little shout out to Mark DeLucci. Hope I'm saying that right from the Golden State of Mind SB Nation. Put out a, a really interesting article the other day where he compared Jonathan Kaminga's year three per 100 possessions stats up against like some actual dudes. So year three, Jonathan Kaminga averaged. Per 100 possessions, averaged 29 and a half a game, eight rebounds. We'll chalk it up to nine rebounds, 53% from the field, 32% from three, uh, with a usage of 24%. Doug, year three, Pascal Siakam, Jalen Brown, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Kawhi Leonard, and Jimmy Butler, and Paul George, averaged less points per game than Jonathan Kaminga did per 100 possessions. That's something to keep an eye on. And and so what ended up happening to all of the aforementioned players, Sands, Jonathan Kaminga, going into their fourth year? Um, well, four of them... Wait, fuck, shit, nope. Ah, I was on such a roll. I was on such a roll. And I, here it is. Four of them were All-Stars. Two of them won Most Improved, and Kawhi won Defensive Player of the Year that year. All six of those players ended up getting into the playoffs in their fourth season. I don't really see that uh, in the cards for Golden State this year. But to your point, the creation, the shot creation, has to come from somewhere without Klay Thompson on this team. And Jonathan Kaminga had a really strong uh, finish to his season. I thought he shot more threes than he actually does. But when you, first of all, I think the average for his career, it's like 2.2 for all three seasons that he's played. Yeah, it's 2.1, 2.2, 2.2 in his three seasons so far in the NBA uh, for three-point attempts. And he's making, like, a career 34%. That's it. If if this is the MLB, 34% gets you in the Hall of Fame. So, um, yeah, I don't don't know, man. I think think there's a world where he takes a leap. Sorry, this is what I meant to say. But if you look at his game logs with three-point attempts, it's like 0-0 DNP did not dress randomly goes four for four one for four two for three it's like just i don't know there's just not that much going on um so i think maybe but if he did it would be as a as a reserve i think victor Wimbanyama is probably the the surest pick here the second surest it's got to be chet holmgren probably right you want to talk about kate a little bit i think everything that you said was right i think you hit the nail right on the head and right now it's just going to be interesting to see what does Cade look like when you give him guys who can actually shoot the ball? Um, you know, you think about Malik Beasley, you think about Tobias Harris, you think about Tim Hardaway Jr. when he can shoot the ball. And uh, Fontecchio, by the way, is still on the team. And I and I don't think that only benefits Cade. Like, I think there's a world where Jaden Ivey even kind of ramps it up this year, God willing, uh, because of because of those reasons. And then I was also kind of trying to figure out how do we shoehorn Jalen Duran into a first-time All-Star conversation and i don't think we can i don't know if we can do that this year just because the east is just so tough in the front court because it's like is he gonna beat Giannis? no is he gonna beat like Embiid? no 
Is he going to beat Jared Allen? If he was going to beat anybody, it would be him, but like probably not, right? What is he going to beat? Bam out of bio? You know what I mean? It's just that the, the deck is kind of stacked against him. Maybe Cade has an easier path in the East being a point guard. But again, I think that's another, you know, you want to do the whole good stats, bad team, his way onto an all-star team. Again, it would just be as an injured reserve. And then you keep going down the list and, and who could, who could there be? Mikel Bridges? What do you guys think about that? Are there too many mouths to feed in New York? Is there, is there a world where he just goes berserk and, and, you know, backdoor baseline cuts his way onto a, onto an all-star team, maybe just through virtue of playing in all of the games. You know, you think about a guy who's not going to get rid. If Mikel Bridges was ever voted into an all-star team, like as a starter or as a reserve, rest assured he would not need an injured reserve because he's never going to be hurt. He's always going to be healthy. Someone else I wrote down, Evan Mobley, maybe? Just got a huge contract extension, as did Cade, by the way. So there's like precedent. There's like a, hey man, you kind of got to, I don't know. I was going to say you got to sing for your supper, but I guess they kind of already did. Halfway did. Cade like mostly did. And it's just been like, we were just basically paying him that because it was like, hey, you're really good and we're going to fucking lose our minds if you go and please don't leave us. Um, even if he hasn't quote unquote earned it because he hasn't played in any meaningful games yet, which isn't his fault, but still. Uh, it's the same thing with Evan Mobley. Sands not playing in meaningful games. You wonder if like Kenny Atkinson, you know, taking the helm in Cleveland, a guy who is rich in identity and you know creating a culture within a team you just wonder what he's going to look like inside of that offense and if, and if he can thrive if offensively he can you know sort of take a leap this year maybe you know another one i put on here shen Goon? maybe someone from houston eventually is going to make an all-star team and he just seems like you know the best passing big not named nikola Jokic. do i believe that um yeah i'm not going to think about it too much but yeah i believe that the turkish agent maybe you know, I could see him on here. Other than that, though, first-time All-Stars are tough because of how hard it actually is to get into the All-Star game. Like, oh, Nick, what about Jamal Murray? Why didn't you put Jamal Murray on this list? Because he's never going to fucking make one. He's never going to make one. And, and not to beat a dead horse and keep saying the same shit every time I bring this up, if he ever does, it will be the same way that Mike Connolly finally made an All-Star game as like a 35-year-old which was as an injured reserve. And there's no shame in that. It's still the same star on basketball reference that everybody else has. But uh, if I had to go in order, it's Victor Wembanyama, Chet Holmgren, Cade, Mobley, Shengun, Mikel, and then Jonathan Kaminga, and just in terms of the ones that I wrote down. So I'll pass the mic off to you guys uh, for that one. And then a different email that we got in uh, from Hunter. Again, copinghoursubs at gmail.com, spelled phonetically. Hunter, welcome to the show. Subject line, shocking, parenthetically, not at all, close parentheses, Lakers news. Hey, Nick. The Laker take is towards the bottom of this email. That's right. I did read the first part of this. Thank you for all of this, uh, Hunter. So as for the Lakers talk topic, let's talk about what I've read this past week. Several reputable accounts and articles have stated that the Lakers, I'm sorry, that they have been made aware that the Lakers are heavily targeting Luka Doncic as the next face of the team post LeBron. As a Lakers fan myself, how many more of these outrageous and unrealistic dream scenarios, were to Nicolas Cage, do we need as fans to keep on believing in them from the, did I just have a stroke? As Lakers fans, I'm sorry, dude, how many more of these outrageous and unrealistic dream scenarios do we as fans need to keep on believing in them? From the, I can't read that part, sorry. By now, every major star has been rumored to be on their way to the team for decades. The Luka thing is so wildly out of left field, especially in 2024. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Br brother, I got to be honest with you, I did not see this. I did not see this and I did not hear about this. I had no idea that um, aggregators were, well, not aggregators. If, if they're reputable, then they're reputable. I would just be curious to send me some links and maybe we'll, we'll circle back on this one. I didn't see this at all, but it's just kind of such as life. You know, it's like the, the off-season cycle for news is what? Lakers targeting someone, player X looking crazy in an LA fitness in an open gym run doing stuff that you've never seen them do before. And then it's like, whoa, are we going to see them, you know, oh, most improved next year? Ooh, MVP loading for like, it's Andre Drummond like shooting 37 footers and then he gets in a game and he can't even make it within five feet of the rim. Um, it's always bullshit like that. And then the other one, which we're actually in the middle of right now, is the generational beef thing. 
you know, the generational uh, beef piece of the offseason, which is where a guy who is currently playing will say something shitty about an older generation, and then the older generation will be like, no, it's actually you guys who are pussies, and then it's a whole thing. I've never had time for it. I don't know what Anthony Edwards said. I do not know what Magic Johnson said in in response. Uh, I don't care about it. It's not my It's not my business, and I don't care about it at all. So Luka Doncic being the face of the Lakers post-LeBron. Yeah, that'd be fun. But we have to remember that the last time that the Lakers had a face of a franchi- the fa- of the franchise and then he left and retired, they didn't have a plan. They were bad. They were really, really bad for a few years. Now, what they had going for them is they had Magic Johnson and, more importantly, Rob Palenka also behind the scenes. And so they kind of accidentally did their way into the next part, like the next phase of of what it, of, of Lakers basketball, which was LeBron James. And then just through virtue of having a you know a, a bunch of high selections, you end up with Lonzo Ball and Kyle Kuzma and Josh Hart and Julius Randle and Brandon Ingram all on the same team. You're like, huh? You're like, what? That's insane to think about in retrospect how well that they did uh, drafting. And so. They're able to flip that into Anthony Davis to make LeBron happy and like it's cool, but there was a world where that didn't work out at all. So to to me, yeah, I'm sure they're going to throw some shit around and be like, yeah, like of course we want Luka Doncic. They want everybody. They're the Lakers. They will pay anybody and they will take care of their superstars. To a fault, by the way. The last contract extension that Kobe got in his career was not a good deal. It was not a good business deal. It was just like, hey, we're the Lakers and we have to maintain this precedent that we take care of our stars. The contract that LeBron just signed Jeannie Buss talking about how it's a bargain. He's 39 years old, making $50 million a season. Yeah, I mean, I get what she's saying, and in a vacuum, she's right like it is. And to be fair, anybody would have given him that contract, but not everybody would have given Kobe the extension that he got. You know what I mean? So the Lakers will do whatever they can to maintain their it's not even about maintaining relevance because they're the Lakers, and even when they were really shitty with the, you know, all the, when they were running around with a bunch of kids. Uh, and like Jordan Hill and like Cartier Martin and shit like that. And you're like, what is going on here? Timofey Moskov, what is this team? What are we doing here? Um, even when that was the case, they were, they, were, they were still relevant. Even if it was for the, sort of the wrong reasons, like they still were. The Lakers brand is forever. It's probably the most successful family business that we have in sports, right? So I, I honestly, no, man, I didn't see that. It's dumb. And I would be, who in the NBA right now do I think could be like they just visually I look at them and I'm like yeah you could be in a Lakers uniform you know as the whoa whoa I don't want to do this I don't want to do this okay because I was I was mis something I said was misconstrued in the previous episode or two episodes ago maybe where it sounded like I was trying to break the Jays up again despite them just winning a championship I was not doing that I was hypothesizing narratively that maybe we'll look back if something ever does happen at this all of this summer kind of being like a what happened this summer even if Jalen Brown's issue is not with Jason Tatum I understand that but <laughs> you guys remember that was it the 75th anniversary like commercial or something that they were doing when Jason Tatum had to put on a Lakers uniform I feel like it would have been a Kobe uniform and he was kind of like whoa because that's like his whole deal so, and who are the who are the other dudes in the NBA right now that cuz I could think like Russell Westbrook and DeMar DeRozan I know are dudes that always wanted to, you know, make their way to Los Angeles cuz like that's home. I don't know outside of them though and at that point, you know, with the Russ thing he already did it and DeMar it's just not going to happen. At least he gets to be in California though. Probably the best thing about DeMar DeRozan's uh trade to Sacramento is that he gets to go back home to California. But he doesn't have to deal with the circus of Los Angeles, you know, and, and the, the, the the frenzy that comes with the Lakers or the Clippers. And he just kind of gets to chill in Sacramento, but he still gets to be, what is Sacramento to Los Angeles? Like a four hour drive? No, it's got to be longer than that, right? I have no idea. I have no clue. But he's still home. He's still there, right? That rules. I don't know. Luca's not a Laker. That guy's not a Laker. I could see... LeBron decides it's over two years from now. He's got to hang him up. And Anthony Davis is left without a chair, not without a chair, but without a partner to dance with, you know? And I'm looking at a Miami heat team that 
is kind of sick of their ringleader, Jimmy Butler. We're kind of like at a point where we're like, hey, man, are you kind of annoying? I'm hey, some of us have been whatever. It's not a victory lap podcast. I don't need to. I don't need to say some of us have been saying that for a while. Crypto scam fucking. Oh, does he say that Anthony Davis character looks kind of nice? And he's like, I'm already the villain. I don't care. I'll go play for the Lakers. Jimmy Butler is the as the not the face of the Lakers, but as to kind of get them through this transitional period. And then eventually, I don't know. I don't know who it would be. For some reason, Shea comes to mind. I could see him in a Lakers uniform. I could see it. I don't believe that while I'm saying it. I don't believe it, but I could see it. Is, does, is Anthony Edwards a Laker? No. I mean, yes, visually he is, but he's not. Spiritually. You know what I mean? Carl Anthony... Ta- no, that's that's just that's just not smart. That's just not good basketball if you put him and Anthony Davis on the same team. What does that look like? Do they kind of offensively I like it. I can I would like it if they had a point guard that could actually Okay, hold on. No, I'm going to make this work. What point guard would I need on cuz defense as good as Anthony Davis is, which I even forget how good he is. You just if you just lock in and watch him, you're like Jesus Christ. So good. Just on, on offense, you would need someone who, who, like, realistic. Cade, fuck. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Can that happen? It can't happen in Detroit. If you, whoa, Cade doing, like, high pick and rolls 40 feet from the basket with Anthony Davis, and then he's going downhill, and it's just like, I don't know, they just, they're in a 2-3. They're in a Oh, but you know who's over in the corner and he's waving his hands and he's like checking his nails to make sure there are no chips? It's Carl Anthony Towns. And then Kate, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know why I'm like writing fan fiction for the Lakers right now. I shouldn't be, do- especially when it involves my favorite player, my two favorite. Carl Anthony Towns, do not lie to yourself, brother, is not your second favorite player. Power rank them off the top of your head. If I'm including Pistons, like Cade's one, but if we're, in- if we're, if I'm not allowed to say the Pistons, Giannis is one, and then Luca, Jalen Brunson, two A, two B, and then after that, I don't, I don't know. That's not important. And then after that is just more Cade, probably more Cade. Yeah, it's delusional to think that Luka Doncic is going to go to the Lakers. I think, right? What's his? I'm not going to look up his contract. I don't. That doesn't. That doesn't matter. I don't. I didn't have anything for this one. This is another one of those. This is another email uh, from Akiva. Akiva, welcome to the show. Subject line, Purge Night. Hey, Nick, recently I've been watching the Purge movies, and it has me asking, if Purge Night was real, which NBA players would partake and which would be anti-Purge? If a team's fans were to destroy their own team's arena, whether it be because they're just super crazy or they hate the mascot or the security guard who made them throw away their water bottle, who would it be? Probably DC. Vandalize the Lincoln Memorial and then drop Lincoln's head from the rafters, shattering the arena's floor. That would be awesome. So, sending love from Jalen Brunson land. Yeah, shout out to New York. Um, who wouldn't? I don't know what you kind of went off there. Kind of lost me at the end. There. <laughs> Probably DC. Do you think so? Philly. Is it not Philly? The dudes who they got to grease up light poles after Philadelphia wins anything significant because dudes will just climb the light poles and like throw like poop at everybody. Uh, probably them. Who wouldn't participate? Jonathan Isaac. Jonathan Isaac would be, you know, in the first Purge movie when, like, the point of it is, like, killing rich people and how all of these, like, Ethan Hawke and Lena Headey have this, like, super extensive security system and, like, this gated neighborhood. That's Jonathan Isaac. Now, gated neighborhood and security systems and all that bullshit. Yeah, that's going to be most of the players in the NBA, if not all of them, if the Purge was a real thing. But Jonathan Isaac specifically, you know? Who would actually go out and participate? I can't. This is the problem is I haven't been able to think of anybody funny. Like Kevin Porter Jr., yep. Josh Primo, yep. Miles Bridges is putting up wilt numbers during the purge. James Johnson, I don't know what he's going to do. It's not that he's not going to commit a crime. I just don't think it's going to be like a bad crime. Like I think whatever James Johnson does, like it's going to be on some like really casual shit. Like some like 
I don't I don't really know because I think everybody kind of nails it with the purge where of course the movies you want to sort of you, you need to create a spectacle and you need to you know make it high stakes and all that shit so to just say that the purge would is just murder basically and should just only depict that makes sense again from like a from a movie standpoint but the truth is is like a lot of us would probably just like steal and to be honest we do that anyways but a lot of us would probably just I go back and forth on it all the time on whether or not I would actually participate in the purge because it's so easy to say, uh, yeah, dude, like I want to be out there like going crazy. I don't know because I think the movies actually do a pretty good job of especially when you're like once you get the first year is going to be maybe when you would want to go out because people aren't. How do I phrase this? 10 years into the purge is when it gets real. It probably wouldn't even take that long. But if the purge started today, 10 years from now is when shit is serious. Because by then, you know, some people have been out all 10 years and they like have a taste for it and they understand. And they like, they, 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 they it's almost like when deer season comes around and you're like, you know, you just know how to hunt. It's like by then you know how to hunt people. And then it's like, then I don't fuck with it. But I think the first year it actually might be a little bit more tame. Than anything, I don't think it would be that much murder in the first year. I think it would just be like anarchy, which, by the way, I'm pretty sure is actually one of the names of the movies. There's just too many of them. I'm, I think I've seen like three or four of them, honestly, and they're super forgettable. Other than the first one, I thought the first one was really fun, just especially because we had just never seen anything like it before. Despite the fact that uh, Ethan Hawke is in it, he's the biggest piece of shit in the world. Uh, what would I do? I would, I if I could, I would go to like Little Caesars Arena and I would just like do weird shit. I don't know what I would do. I would maybe just like record a show. I don't, I don't know. I honestly, I don't know. What would I do there? What would I do at Little Caesars Arena? I don't know, man. There would probably just, that's not where I would want to go. It's like a major arena because that's where people are just going to do the most weird shit. Vandalizing. That's just not my MO. That's just not fun. Like I'm more of a breaking and entering kind of a guy. Those are fun to do. I, I don't do them, Grandma. I'm just saying I would. I would. That would be fun to do. In this scenario, Grandma, I didn't explain the purge to you. The purge is. Uh, it's a movie series where for 24 hours, all crime, including murder, is legal. That's it. That's it. You just can't murder like political figures and like I'm pretty sure that's it. It's like the only stipulation and they have like certain levels of like political figures that, you know. Um, so anyway, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Let's move on to the next segment, folks. Alrighty, what do you guys say we jump into a little bit more of a, a serious email? Now, just for posterity, my son, uh, me, Iho, has officially woken up. I, I'm, he's within eye shot. I'm looking at him bouncing around. He's staring at me right now. You can hear his dad talking. I've learned actually a fun little uh, thing that I've learned about him. If he's ever fussy, dog, I literally put on the coping hour. If I just put it on YouTube, on my PS5, on the TV, and I just put it on in the background, he like totally chills out. And if I like face him towards the TV, he's just like, whoa, or I'll play him my music and I'll like play him data leak and the whole raw file that I have for that he totally mellows out and he'll like fall asleep. Now, if he was any older and me talking to him or playing my music to him made him fell asleep, I would feel some type of way. But right now it actually, it makes me, it's actually pretty nice. It's actually, uh, it's like, oh wow, hey, you recognize your dad's voice. And so, uh, so we're gonna see if he's gonna let me do this. He's chilling right now. He's not, uh, he's not hurting anybody, but let's, let's get through this. Let's get through this one because we got a more serious email right here. This one comes into us from Pierce. Uh, Pierce, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. P-I-E-R-S-E. -E. It's a beautiful spelling if that is uh, Pierce. I don't know what else, I don't know what else that could be. Subject line: Is my best friend really my friend? Longtime fan that has just recently discovered your work in the Coping Hour. I have started watching them from the start, currently on episode 54. Congratulations on the baby, which is completely new to me, but not to others. Anyways, to get to the point, I just want to say to break that, I wanted to read that up top because it's insane to me that this guy might not even know that I'm reading his email for like another month while he's catching up on all these episodes. That's a, that's awesome. Uh, that's a very, whatever. All right, let's get back to the email. Anyways, to get to the point, I have had a friend... For many a year, he has been my best friend since middle school, and I'm sure he would say the same. My problem lies within how he jokes about me and how he treats me. In middle school, he would constantly berate me for being fat and pick on me for how much I ate. For context, I was roughly 5'8 and 150 pounds in 8th grade, so not fat at all. 
And he gave me terrible body dysmorphia, body dysmorphia to the point when, that when I looked in the mirror, I genuinely thought that I looked obese. Looking back at old pictures of myself, you could see my spine through my shirt. Now, though, I actually am a fat man. 5'9", 250 to 260, depending on the day, and he still insists on making fun of my weight, despite repeatedly telling him that that is something that I'm actually very insecure of and have a lot of hatred for myself of, uh, because of. It seems as if he does not care at all about what he says and how it affects me and what it could do to my self-esteem and my self-worth. I do not want to sit here and say that I hate myself and the way that I look because of him, because that would be untrue, but it definitely doesn't help. On top of that, he also berates my intelligence, calling me stupid and the arsler. Arsler. Oh, okay, yeah, he's talking about, okay. <laughs> Knowing full well that I have struggled with being possibly neurodivergent and any other insult that he can muster. There aren't even, they aren't even creative either. If they, <laughs> I don't think you meant for this to be funny, but this is funny. They aren't even creative either. If they were, I'd be more willing to cut him some slack. But it's one thing to just make a half-winded insult, half-winded insult disguised as a joke, and another to say something actually funny. The biggest problem, though, is that I work with him. So Monday through Friday from 7 to 4, he is insulting me. There's never a day that he misses, and there's never a box that he doesn't check off. X's and O's, your parasocial pal, Pierce. Brother, I'm going to tell you something that you already know. I'm going to tell you something that by the time you finish writing this email... Hell, before you even did it, man, you you were able to clock this. This guy's not your friend. He's not. And I don't know if you've maintained this friendship. I don't want to assume anything because um, he didn't include this, but I don't know if you've maintained this friendship because maybe your circle isn't that large. And so it's just kind of the guy that you've always known. You've been friends with him since middle school. I don't think you included your age, but like you've been in friends for a long time, right? And so it's hard to, to sever that. So... I don't think it's crazy to say that anybody that makes you feel the way that you described in this email, like think of it from the other side of this, right? You're on what, episode 53? So what happened, what would happen if in episode 54, I told this story and I was like, guys, can I, can I, can I get some, some, uh, 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 can I get a, a consultation from you, uh, from you copers out there? Yeah, I got this friend who just kind of like makes me feel like shit and like, I don't really like hanging out with him, but like, he's just kind of, it's like familiarity and that's all. I, you guys would be like, and you brother Pierce would be like, that guy's not your friend and you need to do whatever you need to do to sever that relationship. Right. And we've talked about this before from like, um, like a nuclear, like a romantic relationship, uh, standpoint. The trap of familiarity is one that you can fall into really easily. And when something or someone is, is all that you've known, it's hard to, again, sever yourself from that, to detach yourself from that person or that thing because it is all that you've known. Again, man, I don't know if your circle is maybe if it expands beyond this guy, in which case if if it does, then like what are we, you know what I mean? Like what are we really waiting for? I'm sure like you have logged a ton of hours in like Warzone or like WoW or Destiny, whatever it is that you play with this guy. Like I'm sure you have like really good memories with him. The work part of it is the is the part that sucks. That's the part that's really, really hard. Because in my experience, I kind of have two half stories here. It's not going to be totally in line with what you're saying. But, you know, just in the just in that my son is like smiling and laughing at me telling this story. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear him. I don't know if that's going to pick up on the microphone. He's just talking in the background. Um, I had a friend. I've told this story a handful of times throughout middle school and high school. Uh, and, and we got pretty close. I mean, we, we hung out all the time. We did stuff together constantly. Right. We were boys. And then eventually the the place that I grew up is very conservative. And, you know, once you kind of leave that bubble and you start to, you know, you just live in different places and, and in more like liberal cities, you just sort of figure out who you are as a person. And some people never leave that place because either they don't want to or that's just who they are. And eventually, um, you know, one of the other dudes from that friend group who actually lives here in Chicago, I was just texting with him about the Lions the other day. You know, me and him met up with this with this other friend for breakfast one day because he went and joined the Marines and he had come back from deployment. And so we were like, let's get breakfast like we miss him. And we were like sitting there with him and it just it was just over, man. Like we we played nice the whole time. And, you know, it was you know, he he told his jokes that we were kind of like, uh, you know, in retrospect, they were actually pretty funny. We were just being like a little too like PC about it and annoying. 
Um, but it was still the principal that kind of rubbed us the wrong way. And we left that being like, are we just kind of done being friends with him? Like for real, like we were just like, I don't think we're going to be friends with that guy anymore. One of the funniest things that he did at that breakfast, by the way, he had been in the Marines for like six months. And he was like, yeah, guys, it's crazy on our base. There's like this room and you can't bring your phones in there or anything. But if you go in that room, you can look up anything and you can find out about anything. And we're like, did you do that? Because we're all like 19, you know, we're like, whoa, did you, do, whoa, like, do you know America's secrets? And he's like, he just like shrugged his shoulders and he like looked at his wife and she like rolled her eyes. Because, yeah, of course he got married because he's fucking in the Marines. Um also drove a i think he did he drive a charger i don't remember what he drove i don't remember what it was so we're like did you look up like did you look at 9 11 like what did you find out about 9 11 and he was like i can't tell you guys and we were like uh oh all right this is a crisis i'll be right back folks the other friend i had it was a kid that i worked with uh, a couple years ago and him and i got really really close and after work you know we would like we would look forward to working together so that way when we got off we would go over to his house and like we would, you know, stumble into whatever alcohol we could find or we'd smoke a little bit of weed and like it was cool. But then eventually he just kind of like was an asshole to me and he was just kind of like mean and anything that we would do like it was just in the it was just about if we were around other people, it was like putting me down to make him look cooler. And eventually like I didn't know him nearly as long as you've probably known this dude, but I was able to be like, hey, man. I don't, I don't have time for this. Like, I don't, I don't need this. And then eventually we just sort of organically went our separate ways because he went out to, he went off to school and then I just ended up leaving that job. So we just kind of went in our own different directions. And it, again, it just happened very organically and I didn't have to have a difficult conversation uh, with him at any point, mainly because I'm, I'm very much in my shell, uh, despite what it seems like on this show and maybe on the shoot run, I'm not that confrontational. Um, when it comes to stuff, it, despite the fact that I'm constantly looking for arguments, I'm not that confrontational. Like if you walked up to me and were like, you're a bitch, I would be like, cool. And I would just keep walking. Right. I'm not really I'm not trying to do that. Like one day I will snap and I might. Well, OK. So, brother, I, I don't want to advise you to go cold turkey on this dude, because I don't know if that's what, what's going to be best for you. Again, I don't know. All you did was tell me the negatives and by those negatives, I don't know if the positives could really outweigh them. You know, I mentioned earlier, like, I don't know if you guys have like awesome gaming sessions or like what it is that, you know, the memories that you guys have, but is, this is not your friend. I'm sure in his head, he, he, you know, like this is a fun dynamic and like, oh, I'm just, I'm just fucking with you, bro. Like you stop being so sensitive and taking it so seriously. Cause honestly, this is maybe the unpopular take. I don't know, but let's say it out loud, out loud and find out. The middle school stuff is super shitty. It's super shitty when you're in these super formative years, you know, this this developmental point in your life and you have somebody telling you that you're overweight and you can see your spine through your shirt. That's horrible. What I would say to it, and it's not like a, but yeah, kids are the worst, you know, and they don't understand irony or like the shit that you say at home or like what your parents say about people. And like it just kind of maybe the stuff you're watching, you don't realize what you can and can't say to some people when you're a kid. And so, you know, if you looked back, I'm sure all of us could think of a time or two where you were just kind of like, ah, that was kind of a not like not maybe to this extent, but you get what I mean? Like where you're like, ah, I kind of just you look back and you cringe a little bit about how you behaved towards somebody. Um. But again, this just feels like it's a very one-sided relationship where he just gets to use you as a punching bag. And so what's in it for you? You know what I mean? If it's a if it's a matter of like just if it's this guy or no friends at all, again, I'm really trying not to assume that. Um, personally, me, I'd rather be alone. I'd rather be by myself and like <laughs> I don't even know. I don't know. I would I would rather just like form parasocial relationships, honestly. And you guys know how much I'm terrified of those. So I'm I'm sorry, man. I know you're not really looking for pity or anything here. And, you know, the weight stuff. I. It's hard, man. I you know, I've only really experienced the inverse of it where it's like I just like I, I get very self-conscious sometimes that I don't weigh enough. Um, that doesn't happen as much anymore. But I remember one time. Even my grandma was like, hey, are you okay? And I was like, huh? She was like, you've lost a lot of weight. Like, you don't look great. Like, you're my grandson and I love you. You look amazing. But, like, what's going on with you? And it's crazy to look back and realize that she was right. 
and that I didn't look okay. Cause I can look back at some pictures and be like, dude, you weren't eating anything. And you, I, you know what, man, I, I do kind of get it because it was kind of like your middle school self where it was my shoulders that you could see. And like my, like my collarbone is, I mean, you can always kind of see your collarbone, you know what I mean? But it, my shoulders specifically, like the bones were very defined and it was kind of like to look at in retrospect. And so, um, yeah, man, if anybody said anything to me about that, I would have lost my fucking mind. I would have killed them. Please stop being friends with this guy. I don't want to say that, but, you know, please stop because the work thing is tough. What are you supposed to do? Just kind of like, you know, he makes those jokes and you just kind of give him like a nasal exhale, but you don't even make eye contact. You know, you're just kind of like, huh? Okay. And then unless it's work related, you just kind of don't interact with him. That one's going to be tough to navigate. I'm sure somebody will have a um, some good perspective on that one. So Pierce, we're all rooting for you. Uh, this is really shitty that you're going through this. Sorry to hear this, brother. Um, let's jump over to a, another email. Actually, instead of jumping over to another email, can I tell you guys something? I want to. I want to. I want to let you guys know. I've been playing Ghost of uh, Tsushima. It's. It was number two on my list of games that I. I'm going to get around to playing that someday. And for those, number one is Elden Ring. I don't know when I'm going to play it. It's just such a large time commitment. And I just, you know what I mean? And even, I don't even know what the story, like how many hours it is for Ghost of Tsushima. But I only get to play it when he's sleeping, like at night. And so I haven't gotten that far into it. And visually so far, I'm like, oh my God. This, so this is a spectacle. This is amazing. For those of you also who are curious, I am playing this game the same way that I would watch any anime which the only one I've ever watched is Attack on Titan, but um, dubbed, not, or I'm sorry, subbed, not dubbed. So I'm I'm doing Japanese voice actors, English subtitles, and I wanted to do the black and white because it looks awesome, but I'm like, no, I actually want to experience this game and like its beauty and like what the, you know what I mean? I'm sure at some point I'll kind of flip back and forth just to see what it's like once I kind of get the hang of the, can I tell you guys my first impressions on something that I don't like? It seems repetitive, like, all of the gameplay seems kind of repetitive so far. Is that going to change? Where it's like, oh, three guys just ran up to you. And then they just all attack you, like, one by one. And you're, you, I mean, I'm playing only playing on the second hardest difficulty because I'm not doing this to sweat my balls off. I'm doing this to, I don't know, have something fun to do in my leisure time. You know what I mean? I don't need this to be that big of a challenge. And so would that change the repetitive repetitiveness of the gameplay? I guess it would be, but that seems artificial. That doesn't seem real. Um... Because it's just kind of like smash the shield, smash, smash. It's cool when the big dudes show up with like the armor and then you got to like really kind of get their health down. I'm shitting my pants when the in the opening mission. So, OK, so your uncle gets captured and then the woman saves you and then you and her go to the castle to find your uncle and like the big, big bad guy. And then you immediately fight him. You're, he just like comes out on the bridge and you, there's the big health bar and he's got all this armor. I'm like backing up, like, like ready to parry. I'm like, what, how am I supposed to do this? I said out loud to my girlfriend, what the fuck am I supposed to do against this guy? I hardly know any of the controls. What am I supposed to do here? I should have known that it's like in, um, what was the first, uh, it was a Jedi fallen order. It's like the first game when you're up against, which is it the ninth or seventh sister of one of the inquisitors. And you're, you're, it's designed for you to fail. Like you're not actually supposed to beat them. But, oh, thank God. Because I kind of, like, hold my own for a little bit with, like, parries and deflections and shit like that. But I, like, can't get a hit on this guy. I'm like, ah, I'm fucking doing everything I can. I just can't get a hit on this guy. And then he just whips my ass. And I'm like, do I have to just do that again? No. And then it's just a cutscene, And then we just kind of keep moving. I get kicked off a bridge. And then he just lives. This guy has, like, the craziest plot armor I've ever seen in my fucking life. How is this guy still alive? Um, it's cool. It's cool. I don't know how there are leaves falling consistently from every tree always it looks stunning it looks beautiful but i'm just kind of like is this just is this just japan is this just there's always leaves just blowing in the wind again it, it's visually it's a spectacle i'm just wondering if at some point i'm gonna kind of if i'm gonna get it you know where i'm like all right i get it and i just i really hope i finish it because i really really like it so far and then one of you had asked if i had ever played um red dead 2 come on man have I ever played Red Dead 2? Haven't we all played Red Dead 2? I did. I made it a point to do two runs because, you know, my first playthrough, I just did. I just was like, I'm a cowboy. I'm going to do cowboy shit. And I robbed everybody. I killed everybody that I found. A guy, uh, me and I, you know, I passed a guy. 
He, you know, we're on our horses, and he goes, oh, howdy, partner. Bam, you don't have a head anymore. Shut up. Don't talk to me. Loot his body. Tie him up. Throw him on the train tracks. Just because, just because I can. Maybe throw a lasso around him, drag him behind the train tracks. It's not great for the honor system in the game, right? I did not care about that. Um, until I, uh, no spoilers, the game's been out forever. If you if you were going to play the game, I would hope that you would have played it by now. So soft spoilers, honor matters in the game, all right? If you finish the game with low honor, you're going to get a, a quote-unquote shitty ending. And then if you finish, the, but it's like the same ending. It's the, the destination is the same, but the way that it happens is different. But high honor is like beautiful, and it's like, a, oh, it's just such a relief. So after I did the first playthrough and I had the worst honor that you could possibly have, and I was like really bummed about the endings. I was like, God damn, that was devastating. I was like, I need to, I was like, because at his core, Arthur is a good guy. He is, well, he's not. He becomes a good guy if you make him a good guy, but ultimately he's a cowboy. And there's, he sort of blurs this line. He's very ambiguously good or ostensibly good, maybe is the, is the word. Actually, both of those I think work. And so the, but the high honor one as, as, sort of tedious as it is to get through the game and like not have the intrusive thoughts of like just killing civilians sorry grandma it's the nature of the game you get to the end of it and it's such a big payoff and it just really is worth it in the end and then what my um so my my head cannon for my high honor playthrough with arthur was once that ends and i get into the epilogue and i get to just like play with john my head cannon is that John takes it really poorly, and then he's the one that ends up killing all of the civilians. So once I got to the epilogue, you know, you build the house, you do all the bullshit. I like went into Blackwater, and I was like, if you are walking around, you won't be in a few seconds. So like, get the fuck out of here, like go. And yeah, yep, that's how I do. Now I realize the way that I'm framing this is that I play Red Dead Redemption like a fucking school shooter. Um. All of you do the same bullshit. I do not need to try to psychoanalyze myself and be like, what does that say about me? That it's a fucking video game and it's fun? You're telling me in Grand Theft Auto you never got the minigun and just went berserk just because you can? You absolutely did. Some of you still do it. Especially, you you know, you, you switch over to Trevor and he's got like the rage mechanic so that you basically just don't die. The amount of bank standoffs that I have done, like the, it's not Maze Bank, but there's the one that you can actually just go into in GTA 5, in like in single player mode, you can probably walk in there in multiplayer too, but the one that you can just kind of walk in. Yeah, man, I do bank standoffs in there all the time, constantly. Like sometimes they would last like an hour and I there's like no real, I don't plan on escaping. I just like, like when cops turn the corner and I'm like, bop, dead. Grandma, this is a hard one for you to listen to. Uh, a lot of violence in this segment, but it's the, again, it is the nature of these games. You can't really do that, I don't think. I don't think you can kill civilians in, in, Ghost of Tsushima. And then Elden Ring, my problem, I never played Dark Souls, and so that style of game, I know I'm going to like Elden Ring just because of what the subject matter is and, like, the quote-unquote time period that it is. Like, it's cool. Um, I was reading, I try to, man, I I fall for so much bullshit as it relates to the Elder Scrolls VI. I'll read any article. I don't care what publication it is or how credible they are. Most of them are not. They're like aggregators of aggregators of an aggregate. And so it's like sixth hand information. And so I read two stories back to back the other day. One of them was like 2026 is what it looks like is going to be the release date for the Elder Scrolls six. And then I read a different one five minutes later that was like, it'll be at least 2028 at the earliest. And the reason that I was looking into this is because one of my buddies texted me and he was like, Nick, do you think your son is going to be old enough to play the Elder Scrolls Six with you by the time it comes out? Honestly, it kind of like wiggled my heart a little bit. Like I felt a little palpitation because I was like, holy shit. And then I started going down this list of like, what are all the games that I want to show him? Like, what are the, the only one I've identified so far is Starfield. I really, really want to play Starfield with him. Not that that's, it's only a single player game. Um, but, but also to that, I've said in the past, I've said to Maddie that he's not allowed to fuck with any of my ships in starfield and if he does then he's not allowed to play on my computer anymore um just don't just don't mess with my ships we'll make your own save brother uh skyrim i don't know if he's gonna i don't think i'm gonna make him i mean probably eventually i will but by the time he's old enough to play video games i have it on pc so i could just download some mods and make it look really nice but with the lower fidelity you know comparatively to modern games um i just wonder if he'll be like me as a kid and he's like ick 
Like, ugh, where's the... I mean, me as a kid, I was like, where's the 480p? Like, this is 8-bit. Where's the 480p? Where's my standard definition? High definition hadn't been invented yet. We did not have uh, a high definition television. It's crazy. I remember the first flat screen TV we got. It must have been like 2008, maybe 2009 or something. I still to this day don't understand how it happened. This is actually like a real, this is a memory that's kind of coming back to me in real time. My pop and grandma were, uh, they were visiting us at home and my pop and my dad went out to like the store and they came, they were like, yeah, we're going to go pick up dinner. And we were like, cool. And then they came back with a bucket of chicken and a fucking 32 inch Vizio. And we were like, what is this? And they're like, yeah, it came with the chicken. I'm pop and grandma. I'm just now realizing I'm not, that was not real. That's not how that happened at all. You guys just bought a, you and dad just bought a TV and then also bought chicken. And I, it's kind of like my pop used to always do a magic trick. And I didn't realize how he did it until maybe like five years ago. And I told my brother, I was like, Matthew, did you know that this is how he did the magic trick? And he was like, um, he was like, I called him out on that when we were like five. And I was like, oh. And then I came to Pop and Grandma. I was like, did you guys know that I was the only one who didn't know how you did this magic trick? And he was like, but that doesn't matter. He's like, because it made you happy. Damn it. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And I was just, man, I know that there are a lot of you out there who, um, I don't want to phrase that in a way that's going to be rude. So I'll just say what I actually want to say. I told my grandparents this um, a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to them on the phone and, you know, man, life has just been such that I've been I've been very present lately in every moment. And I was just thinking about my grandparents and that I I think my family is slightly unconventional. I think my parents are very unconventional. My grandparents are the spitting image of what a grandparent is supposed to be. And when you think of that in the conventional sense and the the love and the nurturing that you're supposed to get from them unconditionally. You know, I've heard horror stories about people's grandparents and, you know, I, oh, I don't, I don't talk to my grandpa for, for X, Y, and Z or my grandma, you know, whoever it is, but my pop and grandma have been rocks my whole life. And the fact that I, I don't want to say it this way, but I mean, the fact that I still have both of them, I, am glad that I am able to, again, say that in real time and it's true rather than, uh, rather than however long down the line when I look back on it and I'm almost resentful of the fact that I didn't appreciate it, you know, when I did. And so I, it was very important for me to tell them that because, and I'm only bringing this up because for those of you who do still have your grandparents, even one of them, why don't you let them know that, you know, whatever your relationship is with them, um, why don't you just like give them a call or like send them a text and be like, hey, I'm just really happy that I have you in my life. And because it's crazy with them, man, that like they're not old. They're like north of 80, but I don't think of them as old. They do old people stuff. Like. <laughs> Like they, they had to, they, when they were coming home from a, they just went on a little bit of a road trip. It was a pretty big road trip, but they just went on one. And I was like, oh, you know, like, uh, what are you guys doing when you guys get home? And they're like, oh, we have doctor's appointments like immediately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, throwing horseshoes, you know, spending some time at the pool. They do old people stuff, but they're not old is the thing. Like they're just very, they're very youthful and I just love them so much. And I've only ever really, um. I've only known one set of grandparents my whole life because on my mom's side, her dad passed away when she was very young. I think she was like 15, maybe younger than that. And then I was born in 1998. My brother was born in 1997. Her mom passed away like a month after my brother was born, I think is what it was. So um, first of all, that's just a, 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 a really, really difficult set of circumstances that again, man, that's another thing that parenting has given me a perspective on is what my mom must have gone through and how hard it must have been to just not, I mean, it's something, it's, it's unfathomable to not, 
um, you know, to go that long and to just not, to not have your parents. And, um, you know, even if I have problems with mine right now and I don't really want to talk to them, I am very lucky that they are there, you know? A lot of you guys send in emails about, this is maybe a shitty thing to say, but sometimes the emails that you guys send in help give me perspective on what I do have, you know? Because you don't know what you don't have until somebody, uh-oh, we got a, we got a, a shouter over, no, he's just playing, he's just trying to eat. Is that gonna, no, he can eat that. Yeah, he can eat that. That's okay. It's not eating it. He's just putting it in his mouth. It's just a little thing. Yeah, he's not. He has had a really um, a really hard time lately with, like, trying to fucking suffocate himself. Anything that you put around him, because he's in his grabbing phase. It's the most annoying shit in the world, man. He just, he grabs everything. Like, you're, I don't know if I've told this story on the show, so I apologize. But, like, when I'm changing him, he'll just, like, grab the baby wipes from above his head, and he'll just, like, start fucking throwing them all over the place or like if you're picking him up he'll just like pick up a blanket with him he's the strongest kid i've ever seen in my life and so that's all he does man he just grabs and he talks and he laughs and he poops and uh, a lot of diaper blowouts no not that many recently um all you parents out there if you, you guys have issues with that too just diaper blowouts oh my god it is the most stressful thing in the world luckily he hasn't had one in a in a bat like in public in a place where we had to like really scramble and like we haven't had to use a public changing table yet like in a restroom or something we haven't had to do that yet just because we're so on top usually we just do it in the car honestly but we're also just very um diligent with our going out process it's very structured it's very calculated so like we don't really have those emergency like oh we have to change him right now he's actually going in to get uh whoa yeah, no, he's, see, can you guys hear that? He's just talking. He's not upset. He's literally just talking at his toys. Um, he's got to go in and get some shots tomorrow. Uh, I'm expecting them to tell us that he's too big again. Because he's gotten, he's getting big. I mean, he's he's officially four months old now, and he's, he's probably, we don't know how much he weighs, but he's got to be close to like 18 pounds. And the last time we took him to the doctor, they were like, it's probably like June, and he got his first round of shots of like whatever it was. And they were like, he's pretty big. And we're like, yeah, like he's a healthy boy. Like he's eating a lot. And they're like, how often do you feed him? And we're like, whenever he's hungry, usually just usually when he's hungry. And they're like, so maybe just don't feed him all the time. And I, we were like, what the fuck? Like, don't what? I get what they were saying, but like, no, dog, like if he's fussy and we can tell that, oh, he doesn't want a pacifier and he is hungry. All right. Well, then let's feed him. Yeah, that happens a lot. Like it just, I don't know, it just happens a lot. But alrighty, folks, um, if you are listening to this on Spotify, be sure to rate five stars. The copinghour.com is where you can get all of your lovely coping hour merchandise. We'll throw some reviews in in the next episode. I was just trying to take a break from like selling to you guys in this in this episode, uh, uh, you know, a little less advertisement. If you are watching this on YouTube, be sure to leave a like subscribe nice little comment for the algorithm make sure to keep primary control in check and i will catch you guys in the next